Back home, that's in Grenada in the Caribbean, my father and all the elder men, when there was boxing or cricket, there was one radio in the close vicinity, about 200 yards. And that man, although the radio belonged to him, Mr. Wells, he had to turn the volume fully up so the whole community used the radio. And I always remember hearing the voice of Sir Winston Churchill. We will fight them on the seas, we will fight them in the air. And I liked his voice. I didn't like the man, but I liked the voice. So that turned me on to radio. In the days when Black Londoners started, and the name again was, a, I mean, what a fascinating name that questioned both sides, black and white. For many black people of the period, the word black was still, because if you called me black back home, I'd lick you down. But here you are, the political thing has changed. And now we are no more colored. We are black in Britain. And when the name came up at the meeting, the man who was chairing the meeting watched us all and he says, well, you've said this, you've said that, you've said the other, but the name that sounds best is Black Londoners. Alex, can you live with it? Because you will have to live with it. And I said, yes. And I knew why. I'm in a white community. It could be controversial, but people would listen to it. They want to know what's going on. It's a role that I'm glad I managed to play a bit of it. Um, it's not an easy role because as a minority you have to hold a balance between what is called black, Africans, Caribbeans, other blacks, minorities. There are people who, although politically called black, don't want to, to be called black and would not join the union for that reason. There are people who are within the union that question why should we have a black members council. But the reason for having it was to bring some sort of understanding, equality, education, so that we can live together because cultures are different. And with the presence of the Black Members Council before I became the chair, and at the time when I became the chair, things changed a lot. You were able to sit as a member of the NEC, National Executive Committee, and uh, to view your points and listen to others, to take challenges, and be very broad-minded. Journalism will only die if we don't follow change. We're into a new era when people got it in their hands. No more could it be controlled by just a few. That I never agreed with. And therefore, journalism cannot die. I think what we have to watch is whether the trade union aspect of journalism would die. And that's what we have to be careful of. It means that the moguls, or moguls they call them, can rip us off a bit more. The copyright factor we have to look at, because now nobody pays for everything. They're just taking it. Um, we need control. But the type of control that we need is to be individually aware of not libeling or otherwise. We need to be on the spot with journalism. And the union, the trade union, like the National Union of Journalists, I, I would sing their praise. When you're ripped off, you have to have somebody to look after you. And that's where they come in. Journalism, we are going into different forms of journalism now. Self-publishing, we are doing that. Electronics help us to do things. I am pleased that some of those who control it, like the Murdochs and the other people, are no more in full control. And we can begin to level. There are little people in areas that never had a say. They are able. Whether they can say the words right or not, 
what the story is or is not can be captured or they can respond to it themselves. Journalism is not dying. The papers might die, but journalism is alive. To understand kids, to be with kids, you've got to be a kid from inside. My mother made me like this. She used to make us do storytelling, dance and all of that in the evening. That's where I got the gift from. My grandfather took me out in the dark night and in the moonlight, sat me down, frightened me like hell in some ways, and taught me these things. And I find you keep young in your thoughts, very young in your thoughts. I don't think about years, I think about life, life, that's what it is. And the more I work with children, it means the more I can understand them and I can then keep with the times. So for me, when I go to a school, when I meet these children, the messages that I'm weaving, I use that part, it's like the spider weaving his web all over the place. The messages that I'm passing on are to me very important. While I'm doing that, I'm like the camera, I'm looking at them all the time, how they're responding, and to help them to understand themselves. There must be a beginning where knowledge takes a different shape. We begin at home with our parents, the community. We broaden ourselves by schools, colleges, and then the university. Isn't there? Isn't, there, isn't this the best place to have it? There are lots of people who come in to universities, gain degrees and go out, and they're frightened of a microphone, they're frightened of a television. It's not the world we are living in. We are living in a visual world in an or beyond the oral. The oral has become the electronics. And therefore, the university is the most important place as a rounding up of the person to pitch them out into that jungle we call the world out there where you face dragons that you don't see. That's why I think it's so important meeting all these children, meeting yourselves. It is very, very important. Good afternoon, and how are you doing this evening? Black Londoners, feeling high, feeling low, tell it to us on radio. London, London.